this year, I wanted to basically go over the last two sermon series we did, Followers of the Way and Journeys to the Promised Land, and I wanted to try and sort of round off and recap the lessons that we learned a little bit from those from those um, sermon series. And luckily for me, the uh, well, the main two themes that were very central to those sermon series were discipleship, that is to say, following Christ where He leads, and pilgrimage, an outward journey where we achieve inner growth two things that are very integral to my own faith. So I feel somewhat qualified to uh, preach to you folks about these ideas here. So I'll start off by focusing on the biblical themes for those two sermon series I mentioned, starting with Journeys to the Promised Land. The themes that we... The themes were mostly built up around the Israelites' 40-year-long exodus between leaving Egypt and entering in the Promised Land of Canaan. Of course... A season-long sermon series spanning multiple books of the Bible can't be condensed into a single talk, but going to the basics, to the scripture at the core of the series, what is the Bible trying to teach us here? So in Journey to the Promised Land, as we saw from our Old Testament reading today, we see that the Israelites, despite being promised and even shown their future homelands, they weren't allowed to enter into it after they had made it clear from their defiance against God that they did not understand why this land was given to them in the first place. They were greedy and didn't realize the wider picture of their place in God's plan to redeem the world. And it wasn't for lack of trying on God's part either. He spent a good portion of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy trying to get through to these stubborn people, and they just would not take it in. So in the end, he resorts to playing hardball with them, and he sends them away from the promised land for 40 years to reform them into what they need to be. The Old Testament prophets often use the motif of God's people being refined like gold in a blazing furnace. And here we see it most clearly as the Israelites face countless trials and challenges in the desert from starvation to warfare. Yet, whenever they faced challenges in the desert, it was never God being mean or vengeful. It was because God would often let them fall victim to their own self-destructive ways. In fact, he often had to intervene to prevent his people's complete self-destruction, never fully abandoning them no matter what they did to him. It is like a parent telling their child off for trying to cross the road without looking at the lights, or perhaps when you have that awkward argument with your kids around Halloween when you're trying to stop them from eating all their sweets in one go. The message in those first five books of the Bible we covered in Followers of the Way is mostly about discipleship. They teach us that closeness to God and a will aligned with his are the two most essential tools to successfully follow his lead. He is the way to true salvation, and if we keep our faithfulness in him, he will clothe us, feed us, and keep us. God's will is for his people, uh, God's will for his people is to allow us to be our best selves for him and for others, And sometimes it takes being pushed out of our comfort zone and being challenged a little bit to get the right perspective on things. Comfort and routine are good things, but they can get us so caught up in the material world that like the Israelites in the desert, we can forget to consider our place in the world and subsequent duties we have as children of God. We're taught to make sure that we don't, uh, we're taught, we are taught to make sure we condition ourselves to be receptive to the Lord instead of expectant of him. Next up this year was Followers of the Way, where we went through a book called Followers of the Way, which uh, Followers of the Way, Ancient Discipleship for Modern Christians, a wonderful book. And well, the book mainly focuses on our calling to discipleship as inspired by ancient Christian practices, namely those found amongst the Celtic saints. And one of those key features was pilgrimage. Pilgrimage might invoke images of long hiking adventures like the Camino de Santiago or the Via Dolorosa, but in reality, a pilgrimage is anywhere where we can get away from the world and grow closer to God. This can be something as simple as when we're in the gym or out walking the dog. Even though there are easier ways to go on spiritual pilgrimage, I do highly recommend, if possible, going on an actual, proper, like, distant pilgrimage, and the longer the better because it allows you to be alone longer with God and with creation, learning how to grow closer with him every step of the way. Even though the destination of the pilgrimage is an important part, the spiritual growth happens along the journey, preparing you along the way, like the Israelites in the desert, 
so that when you arrive at your destination, you are holier than when you set off and in a far better position to love God and appreciate the new surroundings. I often go on day-long wild camps to connect with Christ in nature. Often, I aim for a church somewhere out in the countryside and trek there and back over the course of a day or two, with next to no cell reception and a Bible to accompany me. Yes, I'm that creepy person you see in the woods at night. <laughs> I, I really recommend going to a Christian retreat if possible as well. In fact, if you speak to us, I'm sure that we could probably give you some pointers if you are interested in pilgrimage, because it's good to get away at least once a year to really refresh your connection to Jesus to catch up like old friends. And in fact, for all clergy in the Church of England, it's actually required, as Emma informed me, to actually go on a Christian retreat at least once a year. The book, like myself, takes lots of inspiration from the ancient Celtic saints of Great Britain and Ireland from the fourth to seventh centuries. Saints like St. Patrick and St. Cuthbert, who were early pioneers of using an extremely austere lifestyle, a regular pilgrimage through nature to be ever nearer with God. Many Celtic saints, like St. Patrick and St. Cuthbert, were wandering aesthetics who regarded closeness with nature and closeness to God to be achieved the same way, as to live harmoniously with creation is a good way to understand that creation's creator. These Celtic saints are often associated with nature, a bit like Radagast the Brown for any Lord of the Rings fans here, because they would often travel from town to town living only off what they could carry on their backs, usually relying on the goodwill of strangers for food, water, and shelter. They lived in a state of essentially constant pilgrimage, where along their travels they would preach, pray continuously, either while walking from town to town or, or on top of hilltops praying over towns and villages that they went to, and they, would often, they would be meditating on the meaning of life and nature in relation to God all the while. Like our New Testament reading, these men and women who, were, who evangelized ancient Britain, which the book calls us to learn from, were people who were willing to drop everything in order to, resp in order to respond to that call of follow me, wherever it led. Some of these saints had comfy lives in Roman France, which they could have, which they could have lived while still working their way through the ranks of the church. There was no practical reason for these people to lay their lives on the line, dodging druids, slavers, sorry, judging druids and slavers, just to bring the gospel to a few villages and towns nobody had ever heard of before in what was literally considered to be the edge of the world at the time. No reason I should say less than the love of God, a love so deep and so profound that it flowed through these men and women and called them to save the souls of these distant pagans. That is something that's amazing about God's love. It makes us love others more fully through him. It might sound cliche, but after reading Followers of the Way, it seems the main lesson of the book is that love, and, on a more, and more specifically, how loving God properly as a disciple and living by his teachings is the key to fixing the sicknesses in our world. If we had loved each other as God intended, there would be no war, no loneliness, no class, and no hunger. If we loved nature as God intended, we would live in harmony with it there would be no mass extinctions and no climate crisis. It seems that the most fundamental thing that we are made for, to love our creator and to spread his love to others, really is the deceptively simple call to all of the world's problems. Discipleship. The journey to be disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is, to be Christian, is like the lifelong pilgrimage of those Celtic saints. We are called not just to have faith, but to live by our faith, following his example in everything we say, do, and are, so that his love can be spread everywhere we go, like a light in the dark. But what is discipleship? Many of us can be put off by terms like discipleship, as it might make us seem like we aren't good enough Christians, because we might not be living a Christ, as Christ-centric a life as we think we can, or we might compare ourselves to other Christians and their faith, despite the fact that we all have our own equally important journey with God. Of course, the goal for any Christian is always to have our hearts and minds set on Christ and his divine teaching. But remember that God is always playing the long game and understands that we have our own paths to him. While Christ may be, may be the only way to the Father, that way can certainly involve different paths for different people. 
Sometimes it's a nice, easy, straightforward path, how I envy anyone here that was raised Christian. But for others, it can be a very windy and complicated path with lots of trials and tribulations and winding, winding and curving ways. But as long as your intention is to follow God, as long as your heart is in the right place, God will give you his gift of grace and you will always be heading in the right direction and growing in faith. Luckily, here in Weston is one of the best places we can grow as disciples. We have an amazing community, wonderful staff and clergy who truly live to serve their flock and so many opportunities to help out. We have programs like The Hub, which we organize with the, which we organize with the Genesis Trust. Shout out to Peter. We, uh, we also have various youth outreach programs, which have been growing extraordinarily over the past few months. Shout out to Ben. We also have an alpha course starting soon. And these are just some of the many resources that we can provide you on your journey with God. Language in North Stoke could probably do with a few extra hands on deck too. Not only do we have All Saints Western and all of those resources we can help provide you with, but we are also surrounded by beautiful green hills on all sides, crisscrossed by wonderful footpaths with world-class views, which are as much a testament to God's creation, his gift for us, as any cathedral. These hills are also dotted with ancient parish churches where you can really feel the stillness of God in their ancient stone walls. Just like it was in the time of St. Alphage, who was from Weston, Weston is like a greenhouse for Christians wishing to grow in their faith. What are some other practical ways I could live a more Christ-centric life? Well, in the book, Followers of the Way, honestly, it's a great book. I really see why Tom likes it. Highly recommend that anyone to pick up a copy if you can. They actually break these things down into very easily digestible chunks, but some which stand out to me both for their simplicity in practice and, in, and profundity in learning are tithing or giving, which is just amazing. Giving in any form you can is the ultimate expression of God's love, which is a gift in itself. And it's receiving that love from God as a gift and then giving it away by giving your time or your money or anything that you can do or even some food to a food bank just to help others. Journeying with a friend, which is wonderfully helpful because, well, if you are journeying alongside someone, sometimes looking at them and having them look back at you can help provide a bit of context for where you are in your journey. And lastly, of course, it would be pilgrimage of any form, but especially some kind of getaway if possible. And well, speaking of growth, it has been an amazing year for growth for us here at All Saints Western. We're all in different places on our faith, but we journey together. And I look forward to seeing how far we have come in our faith next year. This year has been such an extraordinary year for me personally too but also for the parish and community. We've got to know Tom and Mim so well through their various garden parties and barbecue events. We've got to see the rock project finally kick off with the first stages taking place right now as we speak just up the road. We also have the wonderful, had the wonderful Emma join us. And ooh, some of us go out on, some of us went out on pilgrimage to Lords. Our youth programs have almost doubled in the past year and we even got close to and we even got to close down the whole high street so that Weston could sing the Lord's praises last week. As humans, we're fated to travel through time in a linear way, which can make our years seem very long and static. But at times like New Year's Eve, we can take a step back and appreciate how far we've all come with a wider perspective, which is closer to how God sees our journey as well. I also want to say how amazing it is to see all of you choosing to come here today. Choosing to start your last day of the year off in church when you could have very easily justified not coming and having a well-earned lion on, the on, the, on this busiest of days. By coming, you have not only kept the Lord's day holy, which he commanded us to do all the way back with those two tablets, but you are also the reason our local Christian community is thriving. And not just that, but you are also the reason for the continuation of the Christian movement as a whole as each and every one of you help shoulder some of that yoke that Christ gave us 2,020 years ago. But don't feel like the things we've achieved over this past year have happened apart from you, any of you. All of our achievements and growth we have done together as a church and as a congregation. We thrive and grow because of you, not in spite of you. Like I said before, I'm genuinely excited to see where we will be as a church and as individuals over the next year and I really want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of things. Even something as seemingly mundane as showing up for church on Sunday mornings 
means that we get enough people to attend to continue regular services. So you coming here today means you are quite literally in part responsible for keeping these doors open, for bringing the light of creation to this little corner of Somerset. God makes all of us a part of something bigger. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.